Okay. Welcome, everybody, to uh, this week's Bible study. We're continuing our look at the early church. And last week we learned about the devotion that the early church had toward the disciples' teaching, toward the fellowship of the church, um, the devotion toward prayer, and, uh, and how they just kind of came together and uh, worked uh, for the common uh, interest of the body of Christ, the fledgling church. And, uh, and so there was praise and they found favor with men and people were getting saved. It was an awesome time. So this week we want to look at uh, another aspect of that result um, of their dedication uh, specifically more so the disciples, Peter and John to be specific and and how they went from being uh, disciples that were unsure of of their ministry and their place uh, in the kingdom to being confident leaders in the church of Jesus Christ and so uh, just kind of a, a interesting uh, passage of scripture and uh, we're in uh, Acts chapter 3 and I'll be reading verses 1 through 16, and then uh, you'll, you can listen, but the key verse is going to be found in verse 6, and, uh, and you follow along. Now Peter and, and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, uh, the ninth hour. And uh, a certain man, lame from uh, his mother's womb, carried was carried whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple. In verse 3 it says this, Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple ask for alms? And I find this, we're going to come back to verse 4, And fixing his eyes on him with John and Peter said, Look at us. And he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him and immediately to his feet. Uh, and the ankle bones received strength. And so he leaping, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging for alms at the gate called Beautiful in the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And I'm going to stop there just for a few minutes and, and then we'll pick back up. But uh, uh, interesting interaction here. Uh, Peter and John are on their way. They're heading to the temple to pray. Uh, they probably went there often, possibly every day. The Jewish day was from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And, uh, and the special times of prayer were 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. And so uh, I find it interesting that the apostles continued to practice their religious customs, uh, even though they were uh, followers of Christ, new in, the, in, in this faith, established. Um, you know, they could have said, "Hey, we're we, we're not going to follow the old, the old religion, the the old faith," but they s understood that in the old law there was uh, the shadows of Christ in the Old Testament that they had. And so they didn't see it as a different faith. They saw it as an enhancement of their, of their faith that they've had all their life. And so the two came together, meshed together for, for uh, the apostles. And, and so uh, they... We're going to prayer, and uh, and I think that they could have uh, uh, very easily have just 
a lot of times we walk by people all the time that we don't notice. It could have happened that way, but uh, they didn't. They noticed the blind man, um, and the blind man specifically noticed them. And, uh, and what did he want from Peter and John? You know, Jesus had this kind of an encounter with a, a crippled man. And Jesus asking this question, do you want to be well? That seems odd to somebody who's infirm, a cripple or a blind person, or even somebody who's uh, just on their uh, sick bed. Do you want to be well? That would seem an obvious, well, yes. Uh, but wholeness and wellness is more than just physical wellness and, and wholeness. And that's what Jesus was talking about. Do you want to be well? Do you really want to be well? Uh, and these guys, uh, Peter and John, uh, the blind man it was sitting there at the beautiful gate asking for alms, for uh, donations. That's how he made his living, asking for donations from those who were going in and out of the temple. And so he wanted money from them. Uh, he really, there's nothing here to indicate he wanted healing. He just wanted money. And, you know, I find there's an application there. Uh, we experience people today, I, I experience people today in the church all the time. They don't necessarily want what Christ has to offer them. They've become pretty content, pretty settled in being who they are, being where they're at, settling for in life. Uh, but Jesus offers so much more. And so I, I sometimes wonder how many of my congregants uh, sit out there and hear the gospel message. They hear the, the truth principles preached from, from the Word of God, and yet they don't take and, and apply those to their life to make themselves whole and well. They continue to wrestle with things spiritually. They continue to... Uh, to operate in their own strength rather than in the power of Christ. And so I just find that uh, interesting uh, that most people, even who come to church, are wanting something besides healing for their life. And so what did Peter and John do? Uh, it says that they looked at him and uh, said that uh, they, they specifically commanded him to look at them. There's a connection there. He, he, they wanted to make sure that he had, that, that they had his full attention. And then it, and it tells us that he did look at them and gave him his, their, his full attention. Uh, Maybe that's one of the reasons why so many people miss out on what Christ has for them uh, in their life, is because they're not really giving their full attention to the one who can really meet their need in a more profound way than what they even realize. So uh, John and Peter are on their way to the temple. They see a blind man. Uh, they have approach him, he's begging for alms, they approach him, and then you have to appreciate this. I, I wonder what the man's initial response or look on his face was when Peter said, you know, silver and gold we do not have. And it, in that, just in that moment when you hear those words, you know, it's like when that, the telemarketer calls you. Have you ever had the telemarketer call you? And, and I try not to be too rude. Uh, I try to, because they're doing this, they're trying to make a living. Uh, but if they go on and on and on, finally I'll just step in and say, cut to the chase, what do you want? And I wonder, uh, how much money do you want? I've even asked them that. How much, how much do you want from me? Let's just go right to it. 
And uh, so I kind of wonder if he didn't have that same thought. You know, if you don't have money to give me, what are you going to offer me? What? Let's cut to the chase here. So Peter says, silver and gold we do not have. <laughs> and the guy's thinking, oh boy, what are they going to give me? A uh, piece of bread, you know. But what we do have, we're going to give you. Okay. What is that? What did Peter and John realize that they had? Most Christians today do not realize that they have this. What did stop and think about this? What did Peter and John have within them? This is it's it's so obvious that it gets overlooked. But the answer is they had the power of the resurrected Christ within them. Um, the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, we went through that a couple weeks ago. Spirit of God comes upon them. That spirit of the triune God, the presence of, of the resurrected Christ within them is there. The same power of God that brought Christ out of the grave, raised Him from the dead, they realize now they had that within them. And so there's a new measure of confidence that they exercise here. It's not in their own strength. They realize that these, you know, in and of themselves, they do not have the power. So notice what they have. Silver and gold we do not have, but what we have. Not what we can do. Not what we can do. You know, how many, oh, I preached a great message today, or... Oh, I worked and created all of this stuff today. It's not what we have, and it's not what we can do. It is what we have within us, who we have within us. And that's what Peter and John realize. They say, uh, in fact, in their statement to him, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have, we give to you. What did they say after that? They said, in the name of of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, take up your mat and walk. Rise up and walk. Not in the name of St. Peter. Not in the name of St. John. They weren't. They wouldn't refer to themselves as saints back then. But they didn't say, in the name of Peter, the fisherman, take up your mat and walk. Or in the name of John, one of the sons of thunder, take up your mat and walk. No, no, no. They realized that they in and of themselves had no power to do that. But having the power of God within them, the same power that rose, that caused Jesus to rise from the dead and to come out of the grave was operating in them. And so that is what they give him. Can we pick out some significant facts about this passage? Let me share with you. If you look at it, Read the whole passage. And uh, the man never asked to be healed. Never asked to be healed. That's not, there's nothing in this passage that t indicates that. So uh, the man never asked to be healed, yet he was. That's the first thing that's interesting and significant. The second thing is who performed the miracle? Who performed the miracle? If you said Peter and John, no, no, they were the conduit. They were the instruments through which God performed the miracle. Uh, I always go back to this, and I've used it for years, that we are just conduits of God's power. Without his power, we are powerless. But we we are conduits of His power. So we tap into that. And I always like to refer to it back as the uh, uh, lamp in your living room. Uh, you can turn that lamp on and off all day long. But until you, because it's equipped with a cord that has the capabilities 
but it doesn't have the power. It has the capability of carrying the power through it to bring light to your lamp. But until you plug it into the power source, it's helpless and powerless to create light. And so that's kind of what we are. We are conduits. Uh, we are the power cord. We have the capabilities, but unless we're plugged into the power of God, that power can't be transmitted to create the light that the power source wants to shed in our living rooms. And so uh, I find that 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 is what Peter and John realized. It's not about them. This is about God working through them. And the third thing is, through whom did he work? And we just answered that question through Peter and John. And he'll work through you and me if we are humble enough to realize that it's not about us, it's about him. And the fourth thing is, whose faith did God honor? The man's? The man, to be quite honest with you, didn't have any faith. He wasn't asking to be healed, but yet he was. Peter and John, I love this, they were on their way to the temple, and there's this new awareness that they have, and I wonder if you have it today, is there's this awareness that, hey, God wants to do work through us. So they're on their way to the temple, imagine it like this, and they're both walking and they're looking around. And maybe their conversation was, do you see anybody that we can do something? God can do something through us for? Do you see, do you, do you see a blind man? Well, John probably said, well, no. <laughs> and, he, and, and he doesn't see us either. So it kind of works as a two-way street. So they were, they were, I just imagine them being on this, uh, oh, vigilant, alert status, looking around, and they finally see, hey, there's a man asking for alms. There's a beggar. He's a cripple beggar. Boom, jackpot. We've, we've hit it today. And so they go up to him. Look at us. Look at, look at us. We don't have silver and gold, but what we do have, we're going to give you. Take up your mat and walk. And, it, and it, the guy doesn't immediately jump up. You notice it says that Peter took him by the hand. It might have been one of these deals. What? The man was looking up at him. What? what are you, I'm, I'm crippled. Hello. Peter, no, 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 you can walk now. He takes him by the hand and lifts him to his feet. As he lifts him to his feet, uh, the scripture tells us that his ankles gain strength. Now, this is a man who the scriptures tell us that he had never walked. He was crippled from the time that he left his mother's womb. So I find it very interesting that it says that he was not only walking, but he was leaping and praising. And so uh, when God does something, he, he doesn't necessarily have to do it like we do in stages. You know, uh, here's a man who's never walked before uh, that we can, that scriptures indicate and all of a sudden, he is walking. He is walking with them into the temple. He is leaping. He's dancing. He's praising the Lord. He's like, I got two new feet. Yeah, yeah. And he is on it, man. And, uh, and God honors not his faith, because he didn't have any, but it, God honored the faith of Peter and John. And, and I find this uh, just an amazing, amazing account of how God does honor faith and demonstrate his power through those who understand it's not about them, but it's about him. Peter and John had the realization of the power of God in them. And so we see that ninth ingredient uh, of the early church uh, success, and that is the ingredient of power. That is the recognition of the power of God not their own power. What was the outcome of exercising power? Of allowing God's power to be exercised through them. What was the outcome? Man was healed. And now we're going to continue reading. Verse 11. 
Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, or a portico, which is called Solomon's. And they were all greatly amazed. And so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy Spirit, the Holy One, excuse me, and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which you are witness. And verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him his perfect soundness in the presence of all of you. And so there is a whole other story. Peter never shies away from, from the opportunity to, one, share the account of Christ uh, life he's the holy one he's the one who administered who administered uh, through God's power through uh, his ministry on earth you delivered him up to Pilate you chose a murderer over the holy one the just one you I mean this is an indictment on these very people who are amazed and and he just reiterates the fact that John and I did not heal this man. This is what Jesus of Nazareth does because he is alive and well. You couldn't keep him in the grave. And so uh, the outcome of this exercising of power is a man is healed and there's an opportunity to share the story of Jesus once again. And the other outcome, the third outcome, is, is that many believe. Many come to faith. And maybe, maybe that's the problem in the church today, is that we've shied away from sharing the, the story of Jesus, his life, his death, on the cross for our sin, the power of God working in him to resurrect him. You know, there's even those within the church, those who are in the ministry, I'm talking about the church universal now, who don't really truly believe in the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ. They see that as something uh, metaphorical, and it's completely spiritual, but he didn't actually bodily raise from the dead. And, and I think that's... Uh, uh, load of baloney. Uh, we know that Jesus Christ rose from the grave and conquered death. And so uh, He's real. And the power of His presence living within those who surrender their life to Him is very real. The, the biggest obstacle is in our own mind we doubt that Jesus will exercise his power. But he exercises his power not for us to get, to get gain. He exercises his power for his message and himself to be glorified. It's not about what you would hear today about getting big bank accounts. You know, follow Jesus and, and oh, you'll be blessed beyond measure. Now, I believe you'll be blessed beyond measure, but that blessing comes in a lot of different ways. Uh, you don't follow Jesus to get rich. You don't follow Him to gain in power and influence. Let me tell you something. Jesus exercises His power when you and I, like John and Peter, are looking for opportunities 
for to help others along in their faith, along in their crisis, in their need. And you and I become that conduit of Christ to use His power to glorify Himself in the lives of those people through our willingness to be His instruments. That is what the early church had over the modern church. We don't see people being added to the faith daily. Because all of a sudden it's become about us. Why don't you go to why don't you come out to church? Well, I go to a church. Boy, they have a really good band and they have the lights and they oh I just feel so good when I come out of there. Good for you. Let me ask you this. Are you being challenged in your faith to grow and to be an instrument that Jesus Christ can use? to meet the needs of others around you? Are you being an instrument? Are you being transformed through the wonderful lights and the exciting music and the wonderful uh, concierge out in the lobby? And oh, they even have a, a, a coffee shop. And Don't get me wrong, I have nothing against coffee shops. I've gone to church. I would love to have a church that has a coffee shop. Call it Hebrews. Uh, I would love to have all that. Music, I have no problem with the music. Lights, camera, action, I have no problem with that. As long as it's about helping people transform and grow in their faith, that they would be instruments to reach other people with the gospel message of salvation through Jesus Christ. To meet the needs of others, to see other people healed. The only difference between the early church and the modern church is that the modern church has all become about me. The early church was all about Jesus. A modern church is, give me you know, a couple of praise and worship songs and uh, a quick prayer, short sermon, so I can get home and watch the football game. Oh, that was a great message, Pastor. You got out five minutes to twelve. Five minutes to 12 in most churches. Our church, that would be running over because we start early. But you see what I'm saying? This isn't about us. It shouldn't be about our convenience. It shouldn't be about uh, fitting it into our time schedule. It should be about what you and I can do to transform our world as instruments of God displaying His power through us. So that's the difference between the early church and the modern church. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed this series. Uh, this is the last in this study of what made the early church supernatural. And we, we found some things there that we've listed them. And uh, the the early church was so excited about the presence of Jesus in their midst that they did not worry about the other things in life. They, they became really focused. That doesn't mean they didn't have to go to work. They, they still all had to feed their families and pay the bills just like you and I do. But in in their life, at the center, there was the presence of the resurrected Christ. And once they experienced that power in them, they realized really what their purpose as the church is. And the purpose of the church is to bring honor and glory to God. And so uh, I hope that this has encouraged you. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Uh, I encourage you to continue to study if that is your desire. Next week we're going to come back with a, a, another study. Uh, so you uh, feel free to join us. And uh, don't forget to share this with others. 
Uh, I know that uh, I am not a famous pastor, and I don't necessarily want to be a famous pastor. But uh, And I know I have a face more for radio than I do for television or a computer screen. But uh, I do have a real passion to see more and more people come to the understanding that when we're a follower of Christ, it is not about us. It is about Him. And, uh, and so I encourage you to, to share this with others. Uh, invite people over. Have a Bible study. Uh, and pause it. I ask the questions. You guys discuss them. There's a lot of ways that you can use these uh, Bible study videos. I hope you can uh, uh, benefit from them, continue to benefit from them. Come back next week. We'll have a new study. See you later. God bless. Keep looking up.